Hi. Let's see. Let me get all the hardware in order here. Um, is this the clicker? Let's. That's oh, okay. Okay. I don't know. That. It's the. Dale stole it. Thank you. Uh, okay. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, open source hardware, and, and this was an opportunity for me to reflect about what I think it is that's really important and wonderful, and, and also what it kind of isn't, and, and why it's useful for us to kind of pull those things apart. Um, uh, let's see. Maybe I'll just do this. Um, the slides don't seem to be advancing. Let's see. Okay. okay. Um, so the way that I thought that I would do that is by telling kind of three stories, recent stories from my own life about uh, open source hardware, about kind of encountering it and uh, experiencing it in kind of three different ways. So the first story is a story about computational design uh, and a story about how it is so cool uh, to be able to move from source code uh, into a physical object. Um, so a few months ago, uh, I had the great privilege of talking at an event um, with this wonderful woman, uh, Margaret Wertheim, who's the leader of this project uh, around hyperbolic geometry and how you can generate kind of hyperbolic geometries using traditional textile techniques, uh, namely crochet and knitting. So this is an example of this beautiful hyperbolic surface that was crocheted. Um, so she runs these exhibitions called the Hyperbolic uh, Coral Crochet Reef um, that are gorgeous. Um, I had known about her work for some time, but hearing her speak about it just completely got me infatuated. Uh, and I just loved these forms, and I wanted to do something with them myself. Um, and being a computationally oriented person, I was especially interested in modeling them and understanding them computationally. Um, so the first thing that I did along this path is I think what all of you would do uh, in a similar circumstance, which is go to the internet uh, and see how other people had tackled kind of uh, modeling these forms computationally. And lo and behold, uh, miraculous and kind of wonderful thing, they're all there's all of this open source software out there that, that I was able to find that models these surfaces computationally. Um, and so I downloaded a bunch of those and looked at them and I kind of found different ways you could model these shapes and so on. Um, my favorite of those examples was this uh, program written by Karen Jeffries and Patrick Stein. Um, so what you see here is a kind of a snapshot from open processing. So this application is up on open processing if you want to play with it. Um, but this is a snapshot here on the right. You can see one of those hyperbolic surfaces that is generated by their code and on the left, um, the actual source code. Um, so I downloaded this and I tinkered with different parameters and I slowly kind of uh, began to understand kind of how they were thinking about things and how they were doing things. And I learned through this process that essentially their model was relying on these two additional kind of open source libraries for processing, uh, namely a, a physics library that was written by uh, Jeffrey Traer Bernstein um, that I hadn't encountered before. Uh, so uh, exploring this shape led me to then explore um, this new physics library for processing, um, which was super cool and really powerful, and I've since gone on to use in additional projects. Um, it was also um, my first encounter with an X STL export library for processing. It was uh, written by a wonderful uh, designer who I admire uh, greatly, Marius Watts. Um, so through uh, exploring this piece of source code that I found out uh, online, I not only kind of got this new vision into a computational model of this gorgeous shape, but I learned these new tools which have then been really useful for me in, um, in other projects. The final step in this exploration with, for me, though, was after I kind of 
tinkered with their code and adjusted it a bit to get exactly kind of some shapes that were appealing to me. Um, I then uh, sent that shape off to the excellent uh, Shapeways, and for five bucks, um, kind of miraculous, five bucks, um, I got this super cool um, object back in the mail that I love, um, that's totally unique, totally personal, and that I incorporate in my day-to-day -day life now. So for me, this is a story about how open source hardware um, and open source software and that integration can be this wonderful scaffolding, this wonderful platform to encourage kind of personal expression, personal exploration, learning. So I learned a tremendous amount through this kind of passion-driven exploration. And then ultimately, for the production of these unique, strange kind of personal objects that have meaning and utility um, in our lives. So wonderful open source hardware uh, experience here. OK, on to a second example. Uh, this is an example uh, that's a little bit more utilitarian um, and also a little bit more um, frustrating, but there's a, a, a very nice glimmer of hope. So as some of you uh, know, um, I grew up um, in the beautiful middle of nowhere um, in northern New Mexico. This is um, kind of what it looks like where I grew up, New Mexico. Um, uh, I have a lot of friends who still live there, um, and many of them live off the grid, which means they uh, kind of get their uh, power uh, like this. Um, so many of them have these kind of solar systems that generate all of the electricity that they need for their homes. Um, and they're all kind of DIY hackers kind of constantly um, grappling with what, what that means and, and how they can do it better. Um, it turns out that I tend to be often an electronics kind of consultant for lots of my friends. Uh, and sometimes I can be really helpful, and this is super gratifying. So recently, um, this was a project where um, I got to feel like Superwoman because they were like, oh, this thing is broken. I was like, aha, it's that fuse there, and we can just order you a replacement fuse and pop it back in, and all will be good. And we did it, and it worked, and uh, they were, you know, uh, astonished, and I was, you know, it was awesome. Um, but then there are unfortunate incidents uh, like the following. So a couple of months ago, um, my friend's uh, inverter uh, just stopped working. So he has uh, this particular model of inverter which converts the DC energy um, produced by the solar panels into kind of AC uh, energy that he uses in his house to run different standard appliances. Um, and it just stopped working. So everything was, was kosher, kind of coming in from the solar panel and battery side, but there was no kind of AC signal um, coming at the other end of this inverter. Um, and so he calls me up and he asks for my help in like troubleshooting and potentially fixing this problem. Um, so I go over and we kind of open it up and it's a circuit board, All right? Um, and I don't know a lot about inverters, actually. Um, I know a little bit about electronics. I'm, countless of you know so much more than I do about electronics. But we kind of look at this thing. And I was like, well, I'm not really sure where to start. We checked a couple of obvious things. Um, but I bet we can find the plans for this guy online. And with the plans, you know, we could check a bunch more things. And, and that will be a, a great place to start. So I go to the internet, and I look for information about this inverter, seeing if I can find schematics or, you know, ideally kind of hardware di diagrams. And I search uh, for this thing, and I find nothing. So no schematics and no diagrams. There's kind of a user manual, but that's not terribly helpful. Um, and I dig a little deeper, kind of thinking, you know, this solar DIY space is pretty hackery anyway. You would think that they would have plans for these things. Um, as I dig a little bit deeper, deeper, it becomes apparent not only do they not have plans available, but this is a very deliberate strategy by this particular manufacturer and the people who repair these devices to kind of keep that information hidden so that in exactly this situation, you wouldn't kind of try to um, fix it yourself. You would instead uh, go to the repair shop and kind of have them fix it for you. Um, so this was a frustrating encounter where it seemed like 
to, to start to think about repairing this device, I would actually have to reverse engineer it first. Um, so there wasn't much, unfortunately, that I could do uh, to help my friend, and I just felt like, dang, this is a case where I really want open source hardware. Where are you? Um, so uh, the moral of this story for me was if I build my kind of off-the-grid house, I'm totally going to use the uh, inverter schematics and plans that uh, were developed by the Global Village Construction Kit people, um, the open, uh, open Source Ecology Project, which is awesome. Um, they have plans, so don't get that inverter. Get one that you can actually kind of access the files for um, if you're uh, contemplating a similar project. But I think there are lots of spaces like this um, where we can benefit tremendously um, from open source hardware. All right, so I have one more uh, story for you. Uh, and I'll try to make this quick. Um, so this is a, a slightly different kind of story. Um, and this is where um, I kind of uh, put on my uh, curmudgeonly side. So this is a kind of hyperbolic uh, curmudgeonly uh, tale. Um, this is a tale about the lily pad Arduino. So this is a project that I've been working on for several years now in uh, collaboration with the awesome SparkFun um, people. Um, this is a construction kit for sewing electronics into your clothes. Um, so I developed this several years ago um, as an Ar Arduino derivative. Um, and so, uh, and it's an open source hardware project, so you can download all of the hardware source files for this. Um, why did I cho choose to do this as an open hardware project? Um, why did I uh, choose to do this as an Arduino project? Um, well, these frankly are the reasons. Um, I made this an Arduino project because Arduino provided to me um, wonderful, wonderful uh, software that was easy for other people to use. That software was also open source, so I could tinker with the Arduino software and kind of get it to work really nicely with my hardware. Um, the Arduino community, as you all know, is also just fantastic. There's great documentation, great people out there writing libraries, great community support, online forums, just the community component is awesome. So no brainer to try to plug this project into the Arduino project. However, the fact that Arduino is open source hardware had essentially nothing to do with my decision to make this an Arduino project. Um, so you know, open source hardware just wasn't part of this picture at all, even though I was making a hardware deri derivative of Arduino. So you might say, okay, well, yeah, but what about now that Ardu the LilyPad Arduino is an open source hardware project? Doesn't that, like, isn't that giving something valuable back to the open source hardware community? Um, I would say that the fact that the lily pad hardware designs are open source, um, essentially means almost nothing. So what the lily pad is, is like a round breakout board for an uh, AT mega chip, right? So if you happen to want a round breakout board for an AT mega chip, it'll save you like an hour or two of like tinkering with Eagle. But it's essentially not really important at all. The fact that lily pad is open source hardware is mostly meaningless. And I would argue, um, and here comes the really kind of curmudgeonly point, uh, that this is true for a huge percentage of what we cite as really wonderful and important about open source hardware. That a lot of this, it really doesn't matter at all that it's open source hardware. So what's the moral of these stories, these three stories? Um, the point that I want to make is I think that open source hardware is tremendously, tremendously important and tremendously, tremendously powerful, but that we should be thoughtful and honest in our assessment of why and where it's tremendously important and uh, tremendously powerful. Um, and we should not pat ourselves on the back too much for making choices that are really easy uh, but essentially um, not terribly impactful. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. And just, 
Uh, a quick, quick shout out to my student, uh, Jennifer Jacobs, who has a wonderful uh, demo out in the lobby. You should come check that out.